Yeah, uh, good evening and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, joining us today, this uh, evening, morning, whatever time you uh, you have. Um, so this is like our seventh episode of Open Ethics Series. Uh, today we're going to talk about AI transparency and explainability. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Andrei Burlutsky. Uh, I'm head of marketing at a uh, master of code company uh, from, uh, from Seattle. So we are doing conversational AI solutions. That's why I have an honor to be a host today, a moderator, and to help our amazing, wonderful speakers to talk about the AI transparency and explainability topic. So uh, we are going to start. Uh, our uh, meeting today will be uh, will be recorded, so you will be able to um, watch us on the YouTube. So before we start, um, there's a quick agenda. So we have a short opening right now. Then uh, we're going to have a short conversation and introduction from our speakers today. Uh, then every one of them will have a speech for the selected topics that you have seen in your invitation and the agenda of the um, event itself, both on the website, in the LinkedIn or Facebook, wherever you have found the invitation. Uh, one more thing before we continue, I would like kindly ask you to mute your mics, uh, microphones. Uh, if you can, just let us in chat know that you cannot mute your microphone and we will help you. And uh, Nikita, I will kindly ask you to help with that. To the microphone. Okay, so uh, you, um, this is event done for you, uh, and yes, of course, we have a presentation from our speakers, but the goal of the event is to give you insights, overview, and go-dos at the end of the event. Very practical uh, insight and actions that you can uh, leverage immediately after the event or a little bit after that. So please uh, feel free and we will really appreciate your questions that you can go to the uh, Slido uh, and put your questions over there. So on the screen, you see the number um, uh, of the that you need to imp to put on the on the website and please give you questions over there. Um, so then we have. Sorry, for some reason your screen is not showing anymore. So could you please reshare? Uh, maybe you, you. Someone has. Closed me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Right now on the screen you see the uh, link to the Slido. Uh, please put the number you see on the screen in order to get the access to the place where you can put your questions to our wonderful speakers. So then we have closing and uh, we will be um, very pleased and uh, honored if you will join to network and uh, collaborate and talk all together on the uh, on the uh, Discord. You see the link to the, um, uh, to the discussion, to the channel. Also, it can be found in the invitation and event description itself. So uh, we are ready to go. Uh, so, let me start from saying that uh, the companies and the governments for sure need to ensure their data and uh, security, privacy and transparency are at the core of uh, their AI development programs. Governments are already doing this by introducing compliance regulations, for example, in Europe, GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, all businesses must also provide more transparency into how their AI systems are securely handling, for example, personal data. Identifying and eliminating bias from AI algorithms it becomes critical. So they also need to recognize that they are accountable for any negative consequences that occur as a result of their respective AI development, implementations, and at the end of the day, usage. So it's my pleasure to introduce you our speakers today. Uh, so it's uh, Sabri Blackman uh, from London. Uh, I think he will 
be covering very much the topic on advances in privacy preserving computing, zero knowledge proofs, uh, homomorphic encryption, and we'll also explore formal methods and logic for explainability in AI. Uh, the next, my pleasure to introduce you Marcelo Coelho, senior product designer from Expedia, uh, joining us from, uh, from Paris. So Marcelo, uh, welcome. Uh, the next guest, uh, uh, Pamela Jasper, coming from the United States. So also welcome, uh, Pamela, very great to have you. And we are really looking forward to learn more about the uh, recent um, like uh, speech you had and the uh, conference you participated in uh, about the FAIR framework uh, for AI risks. So I think it will be the thing that everybody is looking for here as well. Uh, Rene Cummings. Uh, uh, Rene has a, a interesting line of expertise. She is a uh, AI ethicist, data activist, criminologist, uh, criminal psychologist, so an urban technologist, international consultant. So I think there will be a lot of valuable insights coming uh, from uh, Rene as well. And uh, last but not least, uh, Nikita um, Lukenets, who is actually founder and CTO of uh, Pocket Confident AI and founder of Open Ethics. Uh, thanks for Open Ethics. We have this event today. So, dear speakers, uh, I would like to uh, invite you to join and introduce yourself. Please tell who you are. What can be your or how um, what can be your value uh, and practical appliance of your knowledge of, of what, you, what you will be talking about for our attendees? Uh, so I will start from uh, Marcelo. If you don't mind, please uh, introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, so uh, it, it's a great pleasure to to be talking to you today. Uh, I'm Marcelo. Um, I'm a designer based in Paris, and um, I, I have quite a diverse experience on design, uh, working with different brands. But in the last two years, I've been working a lot on the intersection of design and AI recommendations, uh, both at my last company, uh, Deezer which is a, a service of uh, music streaming like Apple Music or Spotify, and my current one at the Expedia Group, which is more uh, related to recommendation on, on, tra on the travel industry. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for introduction. Thank you. Uh, Sabri, uh, you asked to be the last one, but I think, as I understand, you can be the next one. So please, your turn. Yeah, sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Awesome. Yeah, London. Very good. Um, so actually, I work for a, a company that's based out of London, um, but I'm actually in St. Louis here in the US. So I'm Midwest, I guess. Um, yeah, so uh, what am I doing these days? I'm doing a lot, um, but primarily focused on, um, I've been sort of in the security space for the last six years full time, um, but I've been in infrastructure and embedded stuff for about the last 15 or so years. Um, uh, primarily focused today on uh, sort of provable security and provable privacy and and what that means from a uh, from a regulatory perspective, um, you know, a high level of assurance that the solutions that we're we're building are actually meeting, um, you know, security and privacy standards. Um, yeah. And so uh, a lot of what we'll talk about today um, is about how to make that proof effectively transparent and and you know it's not just based on open trust but um how do we sort of develop standards that require proof if you will so um i'll be talking about um some of the ways encryption can help with that yeah great it's, it's super happy to have such profi with that uh pamela um good a uh, good afternoon i remember you having them already hello hello so I can go next, no problem. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, awesome. 
Thank you. So thank you, Nikita, and everyone for having me today. Uh, my name is Pam Jasper, and I am the CEO of a consulting firm, Jasper Consulting. Um, I have over 30 years of experience as a leader uh, developing and designing front office trading and middle office risk management systems for large banks, brokerage houses, and stock exchanges globally. Um, my background, I started my career as a software developer and um, in more recently, again, I've focused a lot of large part of my career in developing and designing quantitative based um, algorithmic based uh, trading applications and risk applications. Um, in addition, in the past 10 years, my focus has been on in an area within banking called model risk management. And why I'm excited about that is because I believe that model risk management as leveraged by banking regulations lends itself perfectly to this open question we have of how do we manage AI ethics and AI risk within um, an AI development effort. So to that, to that extent, I created a framework, a governance framework called FAIR, which, um, which you all mentioned was presented at NeurIPS this past month or so. Um, and it's based on banking regulations. And I look forward to talking with you today about one component of that as related to AI transparency. Yeah, it's, uh, that's why I was like extremely excited to have you because I saw in your LinkedIn uh, page that you have posted about this uh, framework and we exactly have the topic which is related to uh, not to this particular framework, but to, to the topic how we can create uh frameworks in the business you know to to uh for the uh ai governance uh, exactly. and the framework has over 50 points today we'll only talk about one of those components okay. Bren, i'm looking forward to it super um Rene, um hello are you with us uh, now oh how are you yeah wonderful, wonderful. thank you thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for inviting me I am a data activist. I'm actually the historic first data activist at the School of Data Science at the University of Virginia. I'm also a community scholar at Columbia University where my research is at the intersection of artificial intelligence and criminal justice. I have about 15 years as a criminologist and criminal psychologist, criminal profiler, specializing in therapeutic jurisprudence and uh, homicide reduction. I brought that knowledge to AI where for the last uh, few years I've been working within the space of AI ethics and speaking extensively about fairness, accountability, transparency and explainability in AI. I do a lot of work in the C-suite when it comes to risk management because the flip side of AI ethics is an understanding and a comprehensive understanding of ethical negligence. I also uh, do a lot of work in the diversity, equity and inclusion space when it comes to building responsible technology, when it comes to ensuring that the uh, processes throughout the life cycle of the design, development and deployment of any new and emerging technology are uh, celebrated respects and really builds our uh, transparency accountability explainability and fairness into the product so it's fun to be here and it's always nice to be among my peers my colleagues and and learn as well from the panel that's great uh we'd love to talk with you about the transparency as a product requirement if it could be possible today how to develop specifications for the transparency so i think this is one of the Topics that I understood from your uh, background and what you are uh, uh, working hard and a lot right now. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, then let's continue. We have like five minutes talk uh, or five minutes speech for um, every one of you to start our conversation. Uh, we are not limited only to mine questions, but every panelist uh, are mm, open absolutely to ask the question to uh, every one of you if you if you have, but also the request to our attendees. Uh, dear guests, uh, we see a lot of you, so please use for those who just joined, please go to Slido, enter the number you see on the slide right now on the screen. It's uh, 21632. Uh, and please put your questions over there. And I will take the, your questions after every panelist will make 
his or her speech. So as we started with Marcelo, I can I propose to continue with Marcelo. Marcelo, please roll out your slides and we are ready to listen to you. OK, perfect. Thank you very much. Let me let me start here my slides. Yeah, it, super. It's working great. Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Marcelo, and I'm going to talk about how design can help bringing transparency and explainability to the end user. Um, so as I already presented myself, my experience on the field is quite diverse. Um, but in the last two years, I've been working a lot on the intersection of design and base, uh, especially AI recommendations, both at my last company, Deezer, and my, the company I currently work on at the Expedia Group. And actually, today I'm going to share some examples of what I've worked at Deezer, since it's the work that I have that is public today. Uh, focusing on how we use to design, how we use design to render the smart trackless feature clearer to users. So this talk is a little bit different from the others in the sense that we will be focusing less on how AI works technically or legally, and uh, but more on how it is presented by people, uh, to people in the end experience. So we start the process by analyzing uh, the UX process by analyzing the current state of the experience. Is the experience following known best practices? Is the data from analytics telling us something? So on Deezer's homepage, for example, we noticed that the percentage of clicks on the top banner was very, very low compared to the feature position it had on the app. And that the flow feature, what we called uh, our AI recommendations, was not performing as well uh, as the importance that it had on our strategy. So uh, user, user, user testing helped us to discover the reasons of why this section was not performing so well. We saw that users were scrolling almost automatically from the banner section in a mostly inconscient action due to its format that looks a little bit like an ad. We also noticed that a lot of people that didn't know about Flow before uh, due to our marketing efforts, uh, they were not clicking on the tab since the name and the icon didn't say much to them. Um, um, if you, if I ask you, you and you don't know that Flow is the is the smart track list feature, you, you wouldn't know. So as a product owner, you may ask yourself, aren't users curious to know what is behind the tab? Uh, unfortunately, the, the answer is usually no. If things are not clear, features, even if they are a very if, even even if they are amazing uh, they won't be uh, clicked by users so after identifying that flow was not very well understood and the banner was not performing we did a few prototypes to test the solutions uh, on this step there is no need for code there, there are two todays that allow designers to do pretty believable prototypes as you can see here if this all the scrolling navigation etc and by creating these quick prototypes, validating and correcting stuff before touching any code, you can save a lot of money on engineering resources, time, and people. So in our final solution for Deezer, we decided to remove Flow from its individual tab and bring it to the main user path of the app. Um, because in the end, editorial content, AI content, uh, radio, it's all listening to music. And we also brought for transparency, we brought new content formats to the homepage so users could differentiate in a, in a glance, in a quick glance, what was editorial, what was AI recommendations, and what was live radios. What is nice is that these changes increase not only transparency, but also the global usage of the music tab. Uh, smart checklist, for example, in the first month of the change, they increased the daily usage by almost 10% and radius by more than 300%. We also iterated until people could finally understand what flow mean, meant very quickly by quickly scanning the section through, through copy. Uh, we have here made for you. Uh, we described that it's an infinite mix, uh, favorites and new tracks. 
the same for the con content such as the daily mix, uh, where we show very clearly the faces of artists that were used as a base for generating the playlist. So to recap, um, what I would recommend is to don't make the same mistake as companies did when adopting GDPR. Uh, avoid keeping users from doing the task they want to do. Don't block the main user flow, as we can see on on these uh, banners that uh, that uh, that are quite annoying to people. And even uh, I use GDPR as an example, since even if their intention was good, the practical application ended up being uh, quite annoying, and uh, ended up having very little result on making websites to stop tracking cookies since everyone just click uh, into the most colorful button as fast as possible to get rid of the banner. Uh, my second uh, tip would be to don't forget to test. Uh, qualitative data can give you great insights and qu can be done for way less time and money than you think. Uh, I would be glad to share some uh, books and also some tools. And last, uh, prototypes can be done easily today and save you a lot of money in the end process of uh, ameliorating the product. So th that was it. Thank you very much for listening and um, I'm ready for any questions and any discussion. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, so your experience is uh, really very much close to the uh, product design. And one of our first uh, topic that we uh, wanted to work around is transparency as a product requirement. So from the other side, yes, how to, you know, how to test and avoid the uh, mistakes is a very great experience, but how to, you know, to develop uh, a requirements for the product in order to uh, to achieve the transparency of how AI is working. What's your ideas or thoughts on this or recommendations to our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, on the design side, of course, we we are not touching the technology directly, but we are helping uh, on the, the front end, uh, on the display of the technology to make things very clear to users. And um, I think uh, the main uh, tip that I would give is really uh, because we have this temptation of, uh, for example, if we are going to display a label for um, for the uh, for the parameters that we're using on the algorithm, to to add it uh, very deep down into the settings or add it into uh, a, a step on the on the registration field. Uh, that there is very long and you need to agree to it. And uh, uh, I think that in, in the end that doesn't help, uh, that makes the company feel okay, okay, we are doing our job. But in the end, the user, uh, if you are uh, putting yourself between what the user wants to do, uh, let's say a music service, uh, he's, he doesn't care so much at first about, uh, it, let's say I just logged in, uh, just registered at Deezer, I want to listen to music, I don't want to to to, to check my settings uh, around privacy, etc. So I think the, the, the main idea would be to, and the main challenge also because that's not so easy, would be to how to integrate these settings, uh, uh, this explainability into the main path of the product without uh, resourcing to banners or pop-ups or et cetera. Thank you. That's, uh, I, I mean, full of recommendations answer. So thank you for that. Um, good. Um, well, uh, I, I see that questions are keep coming. Uh, uh, and the question to you, Marcelo, how do you, how do you uh, go about prototyping AI recommender features? Uh, simple uh, wireframes are probably not so um, sufficient to convey the effects of a recommender. Is it right? Yes, uh, that, that was, uh, I think, our main challenge. Uh, for example, for the user sessions that I showed, we tried to, 
uh, one of the things you can do uh, whenever you're starting a user session, you can ask someone to to put themselves in this the the step of, uh, for example, uh, right now I'm working for a, a business travel too. I can ask you, uh, please, uh, you are, uh, let's say, you are uh, uh, an agent, a uh, travel agent, and you want to book a business trip to, to one of your colleagues. So uh, one of the ways we, we figure out to make this work was, uh, let's say, you are someone that really likes pop music, and you just register to the service and then uh, in the recommendations we would show pop music but it is true that um, for the the end results of the algorithm um, the prototyping is it's quite hard to do it's something that needs to be done with a b testing or with more uh, time uh, mm -hmm. so tools thank you for this answer Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, and uh, yeah, we uh, we continue. So uh, we increase the level of complexity. Uh, Sabrit, tell me, please, are you ready to uh, talk now or uh, are you going to be the last one? OK, you you. You've introduced yourself, and now you you will be the last one. I remember you asked. Okay, uh, Pam. So uh, Sabri asked to be like the, the last one. He has some urgent stuff to to complete. Uh, would you mind to join and uh, make a, your presentation, please? Sure, sure. Um, okay, so I'll just share. Can you hear me very Absolutely. well? Yeah, loud and clear. Excellent. Okay. So again, once again, thank you everyone and thank you Nikita for having me on today's, um, today's discussion. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be discussing a component of transparency and as it relates to model risk management and model risk governance, a technique that model risk managers use that's called um, AI model tiering. And it's a way of um, categorizing the risky litness level of your models and your AI uh, platform prior to your development efforts so that it informs your design, your development, your governance, your validation, and subsequent uh, monitoring types of choices. I'm calling the discussion a risk-sensitive approach to AI transparency. And again, it's one of the many components in the framework I created called FAIR, or Framework for AI Risk. So why use a risk-sensitive approach? Well, all quantitative models are not created equal. Models will vary according to the complexity of their construction, the usability, and the material risk impact they have, in this case, to end consumers, as well as the development firm. As such, the required depth of validation and governing approval processes and authority for each model will also vary. Um, Sound risk management generally requires that the allocation of resources according to risk with riskier areas receiving relatively more resources. So how do we do this? Um, model risk managers accomplish this by the use of AI model tiers. We're gonna walk through a simple example. So to create an AI model tier, um, um, program for your, your AI model, your AI platform, uh, first you identify certain decision variables. In this case, I've selected the four main components that my clients use in an AI um, um, application. One is critical harm, use case, and materiality. So they were looking at loss of opportunity. Um, is this a use case or a product that will involve hiring, insurance? housing, education, economic loss. So will it involve credit or lending decisions, price disparities? And finally, loss of liberty, um, increased surveillance, incarceration, or predictive policing. If any of these use cases are present, then we want to have that impact your scoring decision. Another factor is quantitative method. Quant methods, uh, you know, uh, models vary in their complexity. So there's a difference in complexity between a linear regression model versus reinforcement learning. 
um, the type of algorithmic model that you use in your AI um, uh, solutioning impacts the level of risk tier that you give it. Another factor is implementation effort. So the level of model implementation efforts in terms of coding, technical analysis, design, architecture, resources, team, um, even data, data quality can be a thought of here. And finally, data quality itself and data availability. These are the types of decision variables that go into creating a, a, a model tier matrix. So what's a model tier matrix? Well, in this case, um, you determine your model tier. Typically, model risk managers use one of two tools. We use either a model tier scorecard um, or a decision tree. And so today I'm just going to walk through the scorecard. So here you'll see up to four models in each column and all of the factors that we just discussed um, with an additional factor called consumer feedback. My framework FAIR involves the use of uh, consumer feedback uh, in, in, the, in the realm of um, AI incident tracking and leverages that back as a feedback loop back to the development teams. But we can talk about that later. So again, each of these factors, materiality, quant method, data quality, you'll give each of your factors, you'll identify the value range, you can weight them accordingly, and then give each model a score. And then tally up your score. So you can see model one is in tier one, whereas model four is the most riskiest model because it, it you know, it has, it uses other model outputs as a feed for its input. Um, it is missing data, has poor data quality, and involves a loss of economic opportunity potential for consumers. So we would call that a high risk model. So tier one, tier two, tier three, um, tier one being the least risk model, tier three being the most risky model. These, uh, th this creates a final matrix based on th that wherein they determine via your risk based or risk sensitivity approach to choosing the type and level and depth of activity that you will perform for each of your model validation activities. And I'm calling transparency one of the model validation activities. Um, so as, as you, focusing on transparency for today's call, um, tier one, your least model, your least risky models would definitely have require baseline um, selections in explainability or XAI and perhaps model docs. Um, tier two would have all of the baselines from tier one plus, you know, some set of model documentation and perhaps data sheets. And then tier three would have everything that's in tier two. I know that data sheets was developed by Microsoft and Dr. Tim Jebru. Fact sheets just came out by IBM. Partnership on AI has developed or is developing another, another feature set called About ML. Um, so the ways in which the you, you, you know, transparency and other model validation efforts are not a one size fit all. Um, you need to have a risk based approach to selecting the types of tools, techniques, processes, and team sizes um, for each model validation um, um, activity. And here in my chart, I also show approval authority, validation scope, so what level of testing you will perform, review frequency, are you going to review it monthly, quarterly, annually, semi-annually, Will you use a monitoring tool like Author AI? Will you use other types of tools? I know there are, there are other companies that develop tools. Um, this is what model tiering gives you as a product manager. And again, my name is Pam Jasper. Thank you for listening to me today. I provide advisory, executive consulting, program management, and research services. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pam. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there is a question. So uh, recently, uh, so the, uh, let's say, tier one you've presented uh, is, uh, well, and there tier are one more tiers, right? Uh, sorry? Tier one in this example is least. In this example, right, right, absolutely. There are more, you, you told me it's 15 items, right, over there. Yes. So should it be applied by, uh, let's say, any 
uh, AI developer, any uh, AI product manager uh, on any size of the company, whether it's enterprise, whether it's small. And if this document is where it can be found in order to learn for our audience uh, what other items are included in order to be able to reach out to you for more details, for example, in the uh, in the future. Because this builds the important foundation for our conversation today. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. So in terms of follow-up and any references, I'd be happy to meet or discuss or share any information with everyone um, after the call. Um, the, the, the tiering, um, you know, so, so it's a great question. If you look at my chart in the first column, tier one, for approval authority, right now, I think AI and AI ethics, it, you know, CMM talks about a capabilities maturity model where at, uh, um, organizations are, um, are maturing, we're evolving. Um, we're not as advanced yet in the AI and AI ethics field as um, as you know, as we will be in the future. So I think that currently, um, the, the the development teams themselves are are designing, developing, and they are the final approval authority. With a with a more embellished and granular um, governance framework, and again, I go to risk management governance framework um, for your more advanced risky models. You will want more eyes on the approval of those models. Um, and on the um, and on the governance of those models. So for tier two, it won't be only the developers making the decision. In tier two, I'm saying the model validation team makes that helps to make or makes that decision. And in tier three, actually, it's the model validation team, it's the development team, and a governance board called your artificial intelligence ethics committee or your AIE board. I recommend to all of my clients that they have a board and that, of course, that board is both racially, gender-based um, and, and, and other capacities diverse. So we want diverse eyes looking at these decisions. But, uh, but it's a great question. Right now, yes, the dev team makes the decisions and there are many tools that they can use. And this is a framework that they can use to help select when to use which tools. Uh, that's absolutely clear. So then the uh, next question comes from the audience. From the traditional audit perspective, impact plays a role, but what about the probability? Um, so, so yes. So in terms of risk, that's an excellent question. And my background is in, in various aspects of risk. So risk, Generally speaking, across any industry, be it aviation, technology, program management, or AI, it has two components. The magnitude of an event times the likelihood of its occurrence. So magnitude is impact, complexity, type, et cetera. Likelihood is a function of probability default. So um, my framework and what's been used in banks for over 10 years Model tiering is a, is a risk assessment that you do up front that helps you ascertain what level of resourcing you want to plan in your project. It's forward linking, forward linking for or looking for the project. But at, at the end or after the actual test team, development team, the development team, excuse me, test team, and then your model validation team, again, these are tenets of a fair framework. After the, the model validation team evaluates that one model, they assign to it what I call a model grade. And that model grade takes into consideration probability or likelihood. Got it. Thank you very much for the answer. And what are your views on the effectiveness of counterfactual explanations? Should a framework specify exactly how an explanation should be given? Um, yeah, so I think a framework, um, or you know, this framework, the my framework is a governance framework. Um, it's not prescriptive. It's not going to necessarily tell you when to do what. For instance, the exercise we just walked through today, I would walk through this and I walk through this with my clients, but they make the decisions on which tools are important, which, um, which variables are important. I assist them according to best practices that are developing in the AI ethics space. 
So in terms of counter-effectual explanations or other types of protocols or syntax around your explanatory models, and I was just having, um, you know, I don't know if this is related, but a similar discussion with someone yesterday that, you know, sooner we're going to need someone to explain the explain on XAI um, or explain tools for the explain tools or XAI squared. Um, whatever we choose, you know, it, it's, it's, it needs to be done in a collaborative governance um, structured approach that takes into consideration the types of risks that these models have. So my framework, again, is not proscriptive. I'm not going to tell you yes or no, this one technique is good or bad. It really depends, and we need to look at that. And that's what I wanted to uh, ask you the next question for myself. So then what, where can we look at to, you know, to, uh, to learn what to do when, in addition to your framework? What would you recommend? Let's position it this way. Yeah, sure. So I can share aspects of, of the framework and I'm, I'm, I'm setting up courses right now for, for the beginning of next year. Um, the framework, I will tell you, is based on three tenets, um, three main tenets. So one is a bank regulation and that bank regulation is SR 11-7. So you can feel free to look that up, SR 11-7, model risk management, which has been used in banks again, for over 10 years. My clients like that because they like the comfort of using a framework in this day and age where everything is so new, AI ethics is so new, um, we don't know what to do. At least you can fall back on a governance framework that tells you kind of what to do. The second tenet that my framework relies upon is diversity and inclusion. Um, I'm a staunch believer, and you know, there's a lot of research coming out right now that that proves that having diverse a diverse um, um, governance board to help make these types of governance approval authorities and types of decisions is important and necessary to to remove a uh, AI bias in particular. I also recommend um, diverse engineering teams. So the diversity is incremental. Incremental. Uh, um, embedded within my framework and it's a tenet of the framework and the final tenet is historical events so this framework that you're looking at now there's a 25 point or more um, uh, components to it but they're all internal facing meaning what does the development team and the development firm organization have to do but i believe that ai ethics and ai bias in order to be properly removed needs to take in feedback from external consumers so I've been um, having discussions with an organization called Partnership on AI, and they they um, they have a data a database or a tracking database called AIID to track incidents. In addition to them, uh, a woman named Joy Bulamwini has the Algorithmic Justice League, and she also has a tracking database. We need to track incidents and let that feedback to the developers. I'll just end that with saying, you know, if you're developing a reinforcement learning model today, that's for you know, for a lending application. And last week, 15 reinforcement lending models failed. Mm -hmm. You need to know that. And you need a feedback loop that tells you that if, that if that's in a trusted manner. So we need to track these, these incidents as opposed to just waiting until they pop into the news or into a legal court scenario. Um, we, need, we need a way for communities to, to trust these types of tools. And that's a whole nother discussion, um, but we need a feedback loop. So FAIR, my framework, includes that feedback. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for complete answer and set of insights and recommendations. And we have the question from the one of the panelists from Nikita. Nikita, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do have a question. However, I'm thinking for the sake of the time, I will keep it to, to Pamela and I, I will ask yeah. it later and <laughs> then I, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. Okay. Okay. Great. Pam, thank you Absolutely. very much. Thank you for forward for a further conversation at the end of the event. Uh, Rene, uh, we are can't wait to listen to your uh, story. Hey, we can see you for sure, and we can hear you. Certainly. Thank you. So I don't have any slides. I'm going to just uh, speak to you from the heart because this is what I do uh, full time. So let's talk about this. The product that I deal in is called justice, algorithmic justice. 
And I'm just going to give you some few examples that I have had to deal with that you may find very interesting when it comes to the concept of uh, trustworthy AI and responsible AI. So as an AI ethicist and a data activist and a criminologist, I work with AI within the context of intellectual confrontation with data scientists. I'm not a data scientist, but I say that as an AI ethicist and a data activist, I am the conscience of the data scientist. So I am there to provide the intellectual confrontation required in the conceptualization stage where I believe my work is really to stretch the ethical imagination of the data scientist. So when I think about ethics, AI ethics, and when I think about my product, which is justice, and the question of the application of algorithmic decision-making systems to justice, particularly within the context of risk assessment tools that are designed to administer the criminal justice system. So let me give you this scenario. Uh, there's been this uh, situation now resolved, a uh, gentleman by the name of Glenn Rodriguez, who spent about 15 years behind bars. And when it was finally time for him to receive his parole, he kept being denied. And after being denied several times, he had to ask a question, what's happening here? And what he realized is that he had to go one and one with the algorithm that was being used to make the decision on his freedom. He eventually, in a case of explainability, AI explainability, and getting into the black box, had to challenge the algorithm because a fundamental right of the American criminal justice system is the ability to face your accuser. So he had to face his accuser, which was an algorithm. Another case in point, you've been arrested because of facial recognition, and it has been a case of mistaken identity but you still have to go through the criminal justice system to ensure that that stain does not stay on your record. There have been other cases in criminal justice where parents have lost their children to the child protection system because an algorithm has decided on abuse and neglect and maltreatment. An algorithm decided on a decision to take a child away from a parent. We've had situations when it comes to transparency and explainability in AI, where algorithms have denied people benefits, critical benefits for healthcare and, and critical benefits for social services. And now what we are seeing in policing are algorithmic uh, policing strategies, uh, approaches, tactics, uh, techniques, uh, tools that are now being used. And what we're also seeing would be digital arrests and digital subpoenas and geofencing warrants and these digital sweeps that's just collecting data and your data is now making you a person of interest to the police. Now, when you think of that, and you think of the models that are being designed, these risk assessment tools or these algorithmic decision-making systems, you've got to ask yourself, whose model is it? So this is why as a risk management strategy, we've been relying so heavily on diversity, equity, and inclusion to ensure that the process, uh, the life cycle from design, uh, development into deployment uh, appreciates uh, that the design of an algorithmic uh, system, decision-making system, has got to have context. It has got to have context is critical because context is critical to confidence in the system, it is critical to credibility in the system, and it is critical to raising a consciousness of trust that people can believe that the answers that are being uh, deployed from these systems are answers that they can trust. So it comes back to the question of transparency and explainability and their rootedness in fairness and in ethics. And the critical aspect of that is explainability. Uh, the challenge becomes a trade secret and proprietary rights versus human rights and, and civil rights and, and data rights. And these things are critical. So it comes down to the criminal justice system at this moment is how deep into the black box can we go? And how deep into the black box 
should we allow to go? Is it a trade secret? Is it a proprietary right? Or as a citizen, it is my right to confront an algorithm. So it comes back to the question, when you are building a model, how do you code justice? How do you code fairness? How do you code freedom? And these are very critical. So as a data activist, my work is to raise that level of consciousness and speak to the need for due diligence because we can't build models without understanding duty of care and due process and how these things impact on people's lives. Now, a model leaves a legacy. And as a data scientist or as someone who is designing that experience, you have got to ask yourself, what is your role in this legacy? So much of the work that I do looks at the relationship between data and society, the kinds of impacts, negative impacts that we are seeing. And how do we reverse that with a thinking that not only encapsules a risk management approach where we can detect and we could mitigate and we could manage risk, but an appreciation for how important diversity and equity and inclusion are to product. Now, on the flip side, I do a lot of work in the C-suite where I spend a lot of time with organizations helping them build that ethical organizational culture. And that is based on fairness and accountability and uh, transparency and ethics. And it's about understanding the power and the privilege that is built into data and understanding that data is a system and the model that you are creating is creating a system that is cultural, that is social, that is political, and that is even economical. So when it comes to understanding the power of an algorithm and really understanding uh, justice attached. And I think we would all agree that some of the biggest challenges that new and emerging technology has faced in its application would be in the criminal justice system. We've had many uh, research studies that look at these opaque algorithms that frustrate you process or uh, zombie predictions, algorithms that are over predicting risk and, and recidivism. And we have already seen people who have been misidentified and arrested because of technologies such as facial recognition. And we have seen the, the unleashing of uh, many algorithmic uh, policing strategies that are now creating havoc in people's lives. So for me, it's always about just raising consciousness because between understanding, application, and deployment, there's a big gap there. And many of the organizations and the companies that are designing tools are finding themselves in that space, and it's called crisis because of not applying uh, the, the robust and, and, and rigorous guardrails from the beginning of the cycle. So when I speak about data now as a data activist, I look specifically at the uh, collection, classification, annotation, uh, interpretation of data, those designations and those definitions that we use. And to know that every time we define one thing, uh, we're redefining or misrepresenting uh, something else. So as I said to you, my job is simply to raise the awareness and bring the kind of vigilance that you need when it comes to building these models. Because also as someone who works in risk and crisis, if you don't do that application at the beginning, and it begins with stretching the ethical imagination, it begins with an understanding that that lack of diversity and equity and inclusion could really undermine the product that you are developing or the model that you are putting all of this effort and, and resources into. And it really is about the appreciation for a stakeholder engagement and for uh, bringing these products to the uh, right mix of stakeholders before you find yourself in a crisis that could uh, impact not only the finances of the organization, but the reputation of the organization and, and whether or not you may have a job tomorrow. So uh, it comes back again to the legacy and remembering that every technology leaves a legacy and understanding your role in that and understanding there are critical concepts that we must think about 
uh, social justice, uh, racial justice, economic justice, and how justice uh, fits into our model. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you, and I, I would take any questions. Thank you so much, Rini. I think your mindset worth uh, spreading globally, for sure. Certainly, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's inspiring. From the other side, it really gives you the insights to think about. And the first like a question which come, came to my mind, uh, you talk about the algorithm and justice. Uh, let's see from the other side. If we know that, for example, videos can be faked or defaked, what will be the acceptable evidence in the courtroom in this case? Well, the court isn't there yet, and that's one of the challenges we are seeing when it comes to dealing with things like deep fakes and, and uh, disinformation. Uh, these cases are still new to the criminal justice yeah. system. I know at the level of the International Criminal Court, we've been trying to come up with uh, a, a whole new approach to the understanding of this technology, because some of the things they have seen is that a video of a massacre in a particular country could be released or at a particular time, and it may not be of that time. Or you may have a situation where uh, someone has used a deep fake to put you at the center of a homicide, and you weren't really there. So this is creating a challenge, but indeed an exciting challenge uh, for the criminal justice field, because you're now seeing the uh, need for that multidisciplinary approach between tech and law and criminal justice and the need for coming up with new ideas to deal with these new challenges. But the question there or the concern there is the fact that so far what we've been seeing is this new technology, which I'm extremely passionate about. I'm very, very passionate about AI. But what we're seeing is new technology creating old differences and old biases and old prejudices and, and, and a design, you know, methodology that is still very much uh, steeped into uh, some really negative approaches that we shouldn't be here still as a society. Thank you for answering sure. this question. And uh, the one more question comes from our audience. So in proportions, have algorithms been worse regarding justice decision than humans? Well, this is it. The research says, yay, nay, you know, the jury is still out on that. But this is the question. When it comes to a human decision, we cannot make a mistake, whether it's an algorithm or whether it's a human, because we are speaking about life and death in the criminal justice system. This is Netflix where it predicts a movie that you don't yeah. like and you're able to click off or Amazon when it shows that uh, you may like this top or this shoe or this pants or this umbrella and you can say, I don't like it. When an algorithm makes a decision in the criminal justice system, it is impacting future generations of that individual. And it is also transmitting trauma into families intergenerational trauma. So when you're speaking about life and death, you just don't have an opportunity to make a bad decision. You have opened for me and for the audience, I think, an additional universe. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you uh, so Nikita, much. Nikita, tell us, please, what do we see on the screen? I think for Rene will be also interesting. I think I think we're, I don't know whether Rene is seeing the what we see on our side, it's a uh, it's a scale and responses uh, on how people are perceiving or trusting the algorithmic justice. Uh, do, you, do you see the screen? Yes, I do. Yes, yes, yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to answer the question? Uh, no, no, it's not a oh, question. Okay, it's, because. Uh, I know Nikita he just, doing Nikita both, just uh, spoke to me, so I thought it was a question he was asking me. No, 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 it's actually... Whether or not I see the screen, I we, see the screen. We were interested interested to see the reaction of our audience. To, yeah. So how do they react to the topic in which you're actually working? And specifically, how do they trust the algorithmic justice in their field and in their environment? Uh, Pam, I see you have a comment. Would you like to uh, voice it? Oh, hi. Yeah, no, sure, certainly. And thank you, Renee, for that excellent presentation. Um, yeah, I think someone had asked, you've mentioned someone asked a question about 
um, should we address algorithmic bias if, if bias is already within humans? And I've heard this on a couple of other types of, of panel discussions as well, and I concur. And my comment is that studies show that algorithmic bias um, actually amplifies the bias effect. So you're not looking at a one-to-one, -one, you know, there are 10 people with 10 levels of bias, and we have an algorithm or data that reflects those 10 levels of bias. No, if you have, you know, just using random numbers here, if you have a, a, an intensity of a, a level 10 of bias in your data and algorithms, it will be amplified. And so the effect will be hundredfold in the actual consumer community because of the ubiquitous nature of AI. So we absolutely need to set the bar to, um, to, to very high. Our goal is to remove it, to eliminate it. Now, nothing is perfect in a risk management world. We are managing and mitigating risk, and I accept that. Uh, but I also accept that you don't get what you don't try for. So our goal is um, to eliminate it. And also, I think it's it's um, you know it's almost an it's an ethical question. It's a question of morality. Um, if uh, if algorithms you know harm one people. Well, as Renee said, that one person was important. We can never justify harming one person. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for uh, for adding and building on what uh, Renee has uh, uh, has po pointed uh, during the the speech. Uh, so we need we are ready to continue, dear ladies and gentlemen. I see you. Uh, your questions coming. Uh, those who are raising the hand uh, in our chat window, please go to. Slido, or please put your question in the, into the chat window. I will take them at the end of the speech. So, Sabri, uh, the stage is yours. We've been waiting for you. Sure, I can go next. Let me share my screen. And I'll just share the entire thing. Okay, can everyone see? Absolutely. Sweet. Um, so um, I'll start off by saying that um, uh, trying to understand zero knowledge proofs or uh, any of this material in under five minutes or trying to explain it is very difficult. So I'll try my best to go over some of the high level um, sort of benefits and sort of what the point is. Um, so very, very quickly, um, because we don't have that much time, um, privacy preserving trust and integrity is kind of uh, part of the, the pitch line um, here, but we'll go into what that actually means uh, in a more depth here. So zero knowledge proofs. Um, so what are, what are we solving for? Let me make this full screen so people can actually read a bit better. Um, so what are we solving for um, with zero knowledge proofs? Um, which is a little bit more interactive, but if you are under, unfamiliar with zero knowledge proofs, um, you know we're solving for being able to prove identity, uh, data integrity, capabilities, any sort of information um, uh, that is privileged without direct access to that privileged information. Um, and hopefully that'll make sense a, a bit more in a, in a second here. Um, so uh, some points about zero knowledge proofs. Um, and there's there are some graphics here that I'll sort of go into. Um, and so uh, zero knowledge proofs uh, is a very very large field of encryption technology and 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 protocols and things like that. Um, so these are very very high level sort of points about that. Um, typically, it's a three party system. So there's the first party who has that privileged information um, or that that knowledge. And we have a prover and a verifier. And so um, I wish there was a better way to do this, but there really isn't. So if you're um, familiar with something like an X509 um, or uh, you know any sort of private key encryption, um, you have you know a sender and a recipient, um, and there are keys. There's a, generally some sort of CA, um, but you know, in this sort of system, there are effectively two parties, right? Um, and this is sort of um, uh, one of the graphics that I found that describes the sort of uh, thing pretty well. 
Um, and the zero knowledge proof system re relies on um, three parties for um, for proof construction and proof verification. And again, we'll go into that a little bit um, in a second here. Um, whoops, that's not what I wanted to press. Go back to here. Um, and so the the overall sort of point of, of ZKP is that you're able to prove possession of certain information without exposing that information to other parties. Um, and this is called a proof of knowledge. Um, and so this can be things like identity um, or any sort of PII. So I want to be able to provide proof um, of myself without exposing any particular information about myself, right? And so um, you can create systems like of anonymization um, here. Um, you can expose that you have uh, a particular social security number, for instance, but not expose that social security number um, to the system that will then trust that sort of proof of knowledge. Um, you can also use that to, to um, provide proof of transaction details. Um, and I think uh, super important for a lot of you, a lot of you here is that you can use, uh, you can use it to create system of selective information exposure. And so um, all parties can agree on the integrity of the information or the data, um, or that you have that information or the data. Um, but only certain privileged parties can then be allowed access to that, to the, specific, the specific details or those secrets. Um, and so um, this is often involves multiple systems of uh, cryptography or multiple systems of encryption um, and multiple keys. Um, I can have separate keys for exposing this information to privileged parties, um, uh, but sort of the greater system can agree that I have that information and that information doesn't change as it travels throughout the system. Um, and so uh, this is very, uh, you know, heavily used in, in the privacy uh, space in blockchain. Um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of different implementations there. Um, but I will go to sort of an if the go back to the graphic here that kind of explains uh, one very small use case of a zero knowledge proof protocol. Um, again, where we have sort of the uh, the party that has that uh, that private data um, prover and a verifier. Um, and so effectively and generally how these things work, um, the that private data gets sent to a prover. Um, and you can see here that's re really, really important um, is that the verifier in this system never has access to this private data, right? And so generally in other systems, if you want to verify um, uh, verify uh, data specifically, you need access to that data. Um, again, you can come up with more sophisticated schemes where you're operating off of signatures and things like that. Um, but in this case, the verifier um, that's actually creating, you can think of it as the creator of that signature, doesn't actually have access to that private data. And so this is a little bit different than other encryption schemes. Um, and so there is a proof construction on that private data um, that uh, uh, response and proof are sent back to the verifier. Um, and then the verifier is able to then create the verification of that proof. Um, and so again, in this circumstance, the verifier who everyone in the the remain the, the the system has to trust the verif the verifiers and um you know that proof construction is is constructed using their key so once you have that proof everyone trusts that that um that proof is, is valid um but that proof is created without any direct access to the private data right and so um this is the the primary benefit of a zero knowledge proof um and you can imagine all kinds of systems that you can build off of this um cool so let's go back to here um and this is um another topic homomorphic encryption um that is not directly related to zero knowledge proof but kind of is because they often exist in the same context and i want to talk about that a little bit as well again what are we solving um we're solving for how do you operate on data without the need to break encryption um and i think this is actually especially relevant to the folks who are, are, are here today. Um, and so 
with homomorphic encryption, uh, operations on encrypted data should be identical to that operation of non-encrypted data. And there's a, a graphic here that I'll actually show um, that I think does a pretty good job of what this looks like. Right, and so you can imagine if I have uh, two numbers, five and 10, um, and the operation is addition, right? Um, five plus 10 equals 15. Um, in a homomorphic encrypted scheme, um, I can have five encrypted and I can have 10 encrypted, and I can perform that plus operation between those two values and get some additionally encrypted, encrypted value. Um, when I decrypt that, uh, those individual fields, it should equal five, 10, and 15, right? Um, and so the actual operation here is, is the, the addition, and we're able to do that, perform that operation on encrypted data, right? And homomorphic encryption, the, the proof states that um, these should all be equal. Um, and I do have a little bit of a, um, I'm a category theory nerd, so this is kind of like the, the formal sort of view of what this looks like. Um, but effectively what this means is that um, whether you're operating on, uh, when you're operating on encrypted or non-encrypted, so M is the, uh, the material, um, so M, F of M, right? And then we have encrypted M, F, encrypted F of M, this should commute, right? And so we should be able to go back and forth and it'll work, right? Um, and so in this particular graphic, I think it's actually quite useful because it goes into one of the use cases, which is um, mm -hmm. the data area manipulated by the cloud. Um, and so you can imagine if F is a service or um, a third party library that F can operate on encrypted M and then return back to M on prem, for instance, or in a system where there where there's safety. And so I can send this information to the cloud. The cloud has no access to that unencrypted data um, and then it's able to to return and we can decrypt it whenever we want to. Um, cool. So yeah, multiple operations uh, composition should hold, uh, but community pro community properties don't, do not necessarily hold. So in the other example, um, if I switched, uh, obviously the addition is, is a pretty terrible example, um, but there may be other uh, more sophisticated operations where if I switch the order, right, um, of encrypted, um, so if I, let's say in, in, in this circumstance that plus obviously is, uh, addition is uh, commutative, um, A plus B equals C, so B plus A equals C as well that doesn't necessarily hold in homomorphic encryption schemes. So if I A plus B equals C, but in the encrypted space, I do B plus A equals, right? There's not necessarily a guarantee that that, that will also equal C. Um, it also allows us to operate on encrypted fields and data stores. Um, again, if you have a database um, where you have fields that are encrypted, um, you can use homomorphic encrypted op uh, homomorphic operations to operate on that data in that field with, without ever having to um, to decrypt that. Um, and so this might be useful for certain update operations and things like that that are actually pretty fast. Um, and then it allows us to use third-party libraries for cloud services on our encrypted data, like as I mentioned before, without um, and removing the need for trust. Um, and so uh, one of the, uh, I'm working on a programming language and it sort of has some uh, HD operations sort of baked in. And the idea there is that I can um, use third-party dependencies or third-party um, libraries, send, you know, use them to operate on, you know, uh, effectively, you know, PII or secret data to, you know, so I don't have to build that service or that, that algorithm myself, but I don't necessarily have to trust that third-party library with unencrypted access to my data. Um, and so it removes the need for trust in that as well. Um, so uh, Rick, can I ask you please to summarize because we uh, have one more speaker waiting and we're already out yes. of time. We have five minutes per speaker. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so one of the benefits, um, this is, uh, so yeah, so zero knowledge proof and, and HE implementations are a common target for formal verification. Um, and this is sort of important from my perspective in that we can show proof that critical parts of our system are safe um, and we can build further proofs on top of this. Um, 
yeah, so uh, the biggest sort of take home here is that it applies known cryptography and standardization recommendations to an AI, AI and ML context typo. Um, and so there are already institutions that understand crypto very well and understand providing crypto uh, uh, um, uh, recommendations, I should say. Um, and so being able to reuse those existing systems and institutions um, removes a lot of risks and just streamlines a lot of things for us. Um, drawbacks, uh, the implementations are slower than the alternative. So operating on encrypted data is slower than operating on unencrypted data. Um, and there are some uh, uh, ways we're trying to improve that. Um, and the other drawback is that other encryption schemes have large bodies of institutional knowledge already. So um, unless you're heavily in the blockchain space or heavily in, in sort of privacy pre uh, preserving computing, some of these things might be very, very new to you. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Sabri. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a few questions and if we have time. I will ask them at the end of the event. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to uh, to have you. Uh, I like the most the first part because I understood it more than the second one. But thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Nikita, uh, the stage is yours. Welcome to close out today's event with your keynote speech. Yeah, we see your slide now. Mm -hmm. But we don't hear you, Nikita. Nikita, we don't hear you. You are muted. Let me unmute you. Yeah, thank, thank you. OK, unmuted. I've with got a, yeah, mm -hmm. I've got a little challenge with my screen because it was flipped. Okay. Good. Now we see it's changed the mm -hmm, great. Okay. Yeah. Again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for meeting uh, all of the speakers. Thank you for for the audience. Today, I want to talk about the open transparency protocol. Uh, the way machines can talk to each other and display their ethical information. Uh, my name is Nikita Lukinats. I'm a founder of Open Ethics Initiative. And uh, my experience spans from human computer interactions. So the last 15 years, uh, everything that I was doing in one or another way was related to human computer interaction. And uh, those people who work in the field, they typically put the, the human in the center of uh, of the story and trying to understand how can we make this interaction better? How can we make sure that users do, do make their tasks faster or users are satisfied or users are not discriminated? And this was brought me to a current startup that I'm working on where we're building artificial intelligence for coaching, where we focus on psycholinguistics and natural language processing that eventually brought me to the questions of um, of ethics. Um, the question that I want to raise today is uh, the, is how we can how we can operationalize ethics and how can we bring it to uh, not only big companies in big products that do have culture or are trying to show that they do have culture or build some kind of organizational discipline, but also to a smaller companies. And what we know today is that we are already surrounded by the applications and services that use one or another form of AI, no matter whether they call it AI or not, but the consumers, they, they do not trust it. And the question of trust is, is widely spoken question these days. We talk about this question in, in many uh, organization or, or corporate meetings. We do have uh, national and supranational structures that try to regulate uh, or which are bringing uh, certain regulatory initiatives uh, to the space. But what uh, what we try to focus on in, in open ethics is really a bottom-up regulation. Let me tell you about, about what is meant by a bottom-up reg regulation. Um, the fundamental work of uh, Lawrence Lessig uh, has talked about four 
different constraints that can help to to regulate human behavior and uh, bring the desired uh, processes or the desired behavior of, of agents. So what why this could be applicable to to our situation of AI and where? I want to bring an example of food. We can talk about food from from different angles, but we do have a different kinds of food, and this food is prepared differently. But what is uh, very interesting about the food industry is that uh, the decent quality of food is not necessarily brought to us because of the government or associations or top-down regulations, but because we do have a standardized way to talk about food. And because we have a standardized way to talk about food and a way to present it to the end consumers, we can actually unlock one uh, very important constraint or, or, or a force to create a constraint. And this force is called consumer demand or a market, uh, market-based regulation. Unfortunately, in technology space intellect or information technology space in general we don't have this uh, we don't have this uh, as a tool we have a feature based uh, feature based choices but consumers has never had a way to make their informed decision based on risk we used to have privacy policies but no one reads them they're bulk and, and difficult to difficult to read and full of legal jargon so what can we do about this and uh, what we believe in is that there is a way to bring uh, to bring a risk based choice or informed decisions to to the end consumer where end consumer can decide what he actually wants and how he how he can um, use the product and in, in which circumstances and to do this we 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 are building an open uh, open ethics transparency protocol that is a standard that is a candidate for standard uh, and it could serve as a mean of presenting ethical related information data processing information data consumption information by ai products or in general autonomous systems to the end users and to do this we need to find the way how the product owner can actually disclose this information and the product owner has to do several steps to disclose this information first he has to first what what we can do as a vendors uh, if if we start a contractual relationship with another vendor or a sub processor we can uh, bring our disclosure but this will be only a top level disclo- disclosure of our processes and with maturation of information technology industry we see that more and more companies are are driven towards specialization or uh, the microservice architecture what it means is that the disclosure of very top and surface level even describing the processes on this level is not sufficient so what we need to do we need to go one step deeper and disclose information about our vendors this is actually a requirement of gdpr for example disclose a data processing agents for for a certain product and uh, and let users know what what's happening inside so what we propose we propose an automated way to do this and to do this in such a way that the disclosure of the top down land of the vendors bottom up will actually bring the whole market uh, to the to the transparency level but not only uh, will bring the companies who are typically a high revenue companies and which are uh, on the radar uh, of the regulator how do we do that so first of all we need to make sure that the disclosure is validated uh, uh, the validation of disclosure can come through a several steps where for example we will check whether the fields are correct whether the, the disclosure is is not spoofed or substituted uh, if we compare it to a decentralized database of all disclosures but then on the next step and it's interesting that uh, sabri has talked talked about this I, I want to continue this topic we can actually do the verification of uh, of the disclosure and we can make sure that the auditors uh, as a third party do uh, do control and do see the the real information and, and how uh, what the company is claiming that it is doing uh, is actually displayed in the disclo- disclosure. And later on, once we do have this verification, we can chain the uh, all the existing 
disclosures by the vendor of the company into a composite disclosure and present, uh, have this machine readable file and then get the human readable transparency uh, transparent transparency label showed to the end user. And what we did so far, we have built um, a label that uh, displays the tra displays the transparency practices about three key components, which are which are the data, the training data component, the algorithmic component, and the decision decision space component. And the disclosure is free in every company. Uh, even a startup that has no resources can do the disclosure. And as a result of disclosure, the company will receive uh, a transparency protocol file that they can place and display it, and it, it's going to be crawlable and, um, and analyzable at scale. And for example, here we, we present a little disclosure file that uh, talks about the validation method uh, and, and can help uh, the data processors to be aware of the validation method that it, that is embedded in the product. But before before I close, I want to make sure that also the we have a same picture about what transparency is and what explainability is. Um, in the way we think about transparency in open ethics, this is a very forward looking approach. This is the expected result from the system. This is how the system is built or how is it supposed to work. Uh, who is the owner of the system, this is what we want the system to do. But when we talk about the explainability, it's more of a backward-looking view because it takes one concrete decision and goes back and tries to, tries to trace it back and answer completely different set of questions. How is it, what input was used at T0? Which factors were used at T0? How can I object the decision? Or how can I loop, uh, loop in the feedback? What uh, what Pamela was talking about is that the user has to be uh, user has to be the one who actually brings the feedback back to the system, and uh, we here we propose the requirement setup for a software for software developers and product owners uh, on how to approach the unboxing the black box, even if they do not have exact factors. We can provide the information to the user, even if we are explicitly to share what kind of input was used for, for, uh, for making the decision, because users typically don't know even what kind of input was used. They, do, they don't know what exactly is the, is the scoping of the output. So what we want to underline here is that users have the right and they should know what kind of inputs and outputs were uh, were used and produced, and that the developer has to provide a, a way, must provide a way for program programmatic feedback loop for their uh, for their for their automated decision making applications. Uh, on this, I want to close, uh, share the roadmap with you and and the mission what we want to build. We want to have responsible companies on one side, but also the educated users who make informed choices on the other. And uh, to do this, I, I really want to involve you as a community to uh, to onboard and join our open source initiative uh, and to contribute to it in building the protocols and uh, being an evangelist. I'm very much happy uh, all of you are joining this initiative today in our conversations. You are the force. Uh, that that drives uh, the engagement and and the uh, proliferation of uh, of the idea of transparency and uh, ethical applications. So uh, thank you a lot. Uh, here, the very last thing is that you can uh, drop in the drop me in if you want to be uh, involved in the project and and either connect directly on the website or contact me over email if uh, if this is something you would like to to contribute to and as usual what we are going to do we're going to share uh, the presentations with you later on during the uh, during the beginning of uh, January or at the end of December as well as videos right Yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, before that, I want to invite all participants of our today 
uh, talk if you had presentations to share them in a Discord channel. If uh, if you think they could be uh, used for for cons for consultation or if you have some useful resources, please do share them. Yeah, thanks, Nikita. First of all, thank you for uh, absolutely creative approach to uh, absolutely innovative area as uh, AI, as the transparency and explainability. Uh, as I was reading one book, they said that uh, AI transparency uh, uh, happens when AI can be explained. So it's pretty like depending on each other. So something is transparent, but it can be explained. So with that, uh, thank you for summarizing the uh, at the end of the some action items that will be will be done. Dear, dear ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to an end. We have several questions that became that are unanswered, and we propose that we will put them uh, as an answers into the uh, into the our uh, channel on uh, Discord and also with answer in our social networks. If you are not yet subscribed, so please go and join our pages in LinkedIn and uh, Facebook in order to find them. Uh, you can use also Open Ethics Series as a hashtag, uh, whether you're posting something or you would like to find uh, the our resources. And here are additional resources that you can also use. So thank you very much for being with us today. It was a pleasure to uh, be your host today. Thank you very much, dear speakers. It was fantastic, uh, insightful um, evening um, for me particularly, and I hope for the audience as well. Thank you very much for your efforts that you do uh, today and that you are doing outside our, uh, our event in the everyday uh, life in the direction and area of artificial intelligence. Uh, wish you a very pleasant evening. Take care and hope to see you soon during in the Syria number eight. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.